Thank you very much, Hamia. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. And as you can see, I'm really presenting an end user case today. So, although my role with the Rivers Trust is GIS and data management, I'm not a techie and I'm not um, a coder. So, again, like Vasily, you're not going to see lots of code here. But hopefully, you'll get an idea of how. Um, how we're using some of this software and data to really um, promote more sort of open collaboration in our organization and with our partners. So I'm going to start by giving you a bit of a, a who, what, um, a why and a where really. So the Rivers Trust movement in the UK, we're, we're a charity um, and we represent a whole network of other charities. There are now 56 Rivers Trusts in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we're the umbrella body, so we provide training, advice, technical support, and really try and coordinate a lot of the activity that's going on. And we work very closely as well with our um, counterpart in Scotland. And the Rivers Trust movement is the fastest growing environmental movement in the UK at the moment. And we've even, this is probably out of date now from last year, but we've already got something like 200 plus technical specialists who might be farm advisors or project managers, but they also might be GIS and data specialists now. This is increasingly growing. We've got thousands upon thousands of volunteers who actually get out on the ground doing stuff, and they're the real engine of the process. And we've got lots of supporters who might be trustees or financial supporters as well. <coughs> and the what, what do we actually do? So it's very much a grassroots conservation movement. We're described as having wet feet because we're actually literally out in the river doing conservation work, doing cleanups, doing habitat restoration and getting out and about and really involving communities. They are community groups essentially from the, from the ground up. So it's about empowering and sharing knowledge and sharing information and helping people to, to take ownership of their local environment and improve it. Um, and it's about awareness raising and education. And again, it's telling a story. You heard Chris earlier talking about map stories. And really, a lot of what we're doing is telling a story with data and information and trying to help people understand complex environmental problems and what they can do about it. And it's about partnership working. We work very closely with DEFRA, the Environment Agency, because we're helping to deliver things like the Water Framework Directive, a piece of EU legislation all about the water and ecosystem. But we work very closely with other European partners as well. We run a lot of um, European projects, interreg projects, etc. We work with other non-government partners, community groups. Everything we do has to be in collaboration. We don't own any land. We can't mandate what happens in a river. Um, we can only do it by collaboration, and that's really important. So a bit about the why. Why do Rivers Trusts exist? So this is about the connection between what we do with land and land use and what happens to the water that flows through it and runs down through a river catchment and into our rivers. So land is obviously a finite resource. This country in particular has very little land for the population. Global populations are only set to increase and that is creating a huge pressure on that land resource to produce food. And we've got an increasing demand for dairy and meat products which demand more and more land as well. <coughs> In the UK we're only around 60% self-sufficient. So we don't have enough land to produce the food demand. And we all know what climate change forecasts are saying about the changes in our weather patterns which will increasingly put pressure on this food production and on the water system that supports it. And since the, the war in this um, country and, and elsewhere, we've seen growing pressure from this food production network on the land. And the agricultural pressures can be seen you know, in and around the countryside. We've got um, overgrazing and overstocking and we've got direct pollution into watercourses we've got really damaged soils and loss of soils you know there's a statistic that we've lost on average about a third of our topsoil since the second world war due to to mismanagement and just really um sort of poor farming practices that are 
they're pressurised by the need to produce cheap food and, and really prioritising that over anything else that happens. And, you know, it's a perfect storm, really, of, of things that are contributing to, to damage the ecosystem and damage the environment. And a lot of this in the agricultural system can be represented um, through a sort of source pathway receptor model. So you have lots of sources of pollution and pressure. So it can be um, crops that are planted too close to the river so that the soil actually is exposed during high rainfall and runs straight into the river. Or it can be mismanagement of a farmyard, so manure and slurry get straight into the river. It can be overstocking and allowing cattle and livestock straight into the river. You get real human health problems as well as uh, environmental damage. And we see these impacts all over the place. And there are other pressures. There are urban pressures. The, the increase in urban populations means we're getting more and more areas paved over. Water is running much more quickly into rivers and we're seeing floods and increased pollution due to that. So it's, it is a perfect storm and the impacts are showing up in our fresh water and, and coastal and um, transitional water bodies. So in our reservoirs and lakes we're getting algal blooms because we're getting lots of nutrients into the system causing algal blooms and those have their own health impacts and ecological impacts. We're seeing direct impacts in the rivers, fish kills and the ecosystem is really being impacted. Down at the bottom of the catchment in harbours and estuaries we're seeing, sorry louder, we're seeing the impact of sediment and soil running off and collecting down at the bottom. It's costing a lot of money to dredge these waterways and open them back up again. And that's you know a direct cost to local authorities. We're also seeing the impacts on communities from flooding. As this water runs off the land very quickly, um, it's not being held back and we're getting increased flood. So there's lots of impacts being felt. And this is largely because we are focusing very much on what river catchments provide in terms of those food and fuel resources and maybe some drinking water as well. But we're, we're forgetting that there are other services which have a value that those areas produce. They regulate climate change gases, they regulate greenhouse gases, they regulate the water levels so they can regulate flood impacts and drought impacts. And they also provide us with areas for recreation and they provide biodiversity, all of which has a value. But the imbalance in the system at the moment, in our agricultural ecosystem, means that we're seeing these food and fuel services dominating and really what we need to return to is a more balanced ecosystem where all of the services have value and that the landowners get paid for those services. So I'm going to talk now just a little bit about catchment management planning <coughs> and how we can do something about this. Now there are lots of agencies and groups getting involved at the moment in catchment management planning. So it's about identifying the, the risks, describing the catchment, identifying and classifying how good a quality it is, and finding out where there is a problem and where the problem's coming from. And you can then identify a target and go and do something about it. And that's not just the environment agency's job, it's everybody who's involved has to deliver this together. So identifying problems and doing something about it. Well, I've got a good example here of, you can see soil running straight into a river here. This really creates a problem, not just because it's bringing pollution with it, but it's coating the stream bed in sediment and it's meaning that fish can't spawn and it's damaging the ecosystem. And also you're losing a lot of soil off the land and you're losing nutrients with it, so it's costing us. Now we're using um, a piece of software called SIMAP, which is built on an open source platform. It's built on the Saga GIS platform. And it was developed in collaboration. It was Environment Agency and the universities and one of our Rivers Trusts that developed it. And it basically takes three different data sets, one of which is open source, but the other two, the land use and the um, digital elevation data, unfortunately aren't at the moment. So this is a problem for some groups trying to get hold of the data because it costs a lot. 
But the model is really useful because it helps us target where we go out and do work. So first of all, we can target rivers that might be impacted by this so we know in a large catchment area where we can start first because it always comes down to going out on the ground. We don't just use computer models and sit at our desks. We actually have to get our wellies on and get out there. But it also helps to identify areas where that um, sediment pollution might be coming from. And this is really valuable when you're going out giving farm advice and engaging with landowners and outputs like this where you can drape something over a 3D model and show the areas in red which might be contributing sediment into the river and where you could actually put in an intervention. Remember that source pathway, you want to break those pathways, you want to stop that pollution getting into the river. And this really helps when we're going out giving farm advice, producing soil management plans. And it also helps target where you can habitat works um, that will basically break that pathway. So basically by fencing off the river here, we've actually produced a buffer around the river. And it helps to stop um, pollution getting straight into that watercourse. And it provides other benefits as well, it provides biodiversity. So by mapping some of these various ecosystem services that you saw earlier, we can actually identify areas in the catchment that are important for producing drinking water, that are important for slowing down water as it enters the system and pre preventing flood, but also storing water and releasing it slowly to help prevent drought. We can map areas that are important for carbon sequestration. All of these can be brought together and we can identify areas that produce multiple benefits. And this is the foundation really for starting to um, open up a payments for ecosystem services market. We recognise it will take a long time to do this. It's going to need governments to set up and, and provide the framework for that. But knowing where those services are most important will then help you identify the areas that you can focus on food production and make it sustainable. And here's an example. These are wetland restoration projects that Southwest Water have paid for because they're interested in cleaning up um, raw water quality. It's a cost benefit to them of about 65 to 1 to pay for work in the catchment rather than paying to treat the water right at the bottom. And it brings so many other benefits with it. A wetland will store carbon. It'll slow down flood water. It'll help basically feed the, the base flow of the river so you don't get so much of a, a drought and, and flood. And it provides recreation and amenity and biodiversity, multiple benefits. But to be able to action this and to get land use change, you've got to bring the landowners and the partners along with you. You've got to help them understand what the problem is and what your evidence is. And this is just a quote from one of our Rivers Trusts up in... Um, Cumbria, who were basically using the outputs of an environment agency model, um, which is called the source apportionment tool. So this is really showing, in green you can see that these pie charts show how much of the phosphate um, pollution problem in a catchment is attributed to livestock farming. So you can see this is really dominating in Cumbria, we've got a lot of sheep farmers here. And being able to share information like this really helps to influence people's attitudes. So it's not just though about producing a pretty map and sharing it with them. It's also about involving them in the whole process. And we've been trialing what we call the adaptive modeling process, where we actually get farmers to input their own data into the system. So rather than taking national statistics on agriculture and livestock numbers, we actually get the farmers straight sitting down at the laptop and putting their real data in so that we can show if they change their behavior how we can influence the the water quality and the improvements and it really does engage people and they believe in it so much more so i just want to give you some examples really of some of the um, free and open data that we're using in the rivers trust and i'm sure there's stuff that i've missed here because when i came to do this it was surprising how much we're actually relying on this now and it's been such a boon for us actually being able to access so much of this and um, you know it's identifying base mapping and and background mapping but it's also historical maps which can tell us a lot about 
where the river course used to be before it was straightened. If we want to restore a river, you go back to the old OS maps and you can see where the meanders used to be. Or you can see where the parish boundary used to be, and that's usually along the river. The Environment Agency and other government statutory agencies are doing a huge amount to open up their data, and this has been really helpful to us. We work very closely with the EA on this, and we access their data now through linked data applications as well, and we're helping to identify the user requirements for those. But there's still a problem, and we come up against this all the time. A lot of these technical solutions and models are produced either by universities or by partnerships with um, consultancies and they create this huge third party IPR problem where we can't get hold of the data or there's resistance or it costs too much and it just makes a lot of these tools inaccessible and I explained earlier how just presenting an output map isn't really good enough. You've got to get people's buy-in. You've got to bring them along in that story. And if they can't get hold of the data, and if we can't use the tools and improve the data that goes into them, then it's a lost opportunity, really. And we can't demonstrate those win-wins and influence people without access to those data sets and to the software. Now we've got a vision, and this is probably a long way off yet, but this is where we want to be going, because we don't want to become part of the problem. Increasingly, the Rivers Trusts are contributing to this evidence base and gathering data, and you saw how many Rivers Trusts we've got, and you know, I'm the only one sitting in that umbrella organisation who's trying to coordinate what everyone's doing and come up with some standards and ways of doing it. And part of my reason for being here today is to try and work out you know, what I can do better and anyone who's got any ideas and wants to get involved come and see me but we really want to I mean the the government are, are sort of doing really good things with sharing their data the research community we want to build a local community knowledge base really where we can share this information and adopt all of these sort of open standards and really join things up a bit more and you know adopt things like linked data as an approach so that we can combine all of this evidence together and there's lots of things going on that we could see the potential for this. But bringing it back to the here and now, I'm just going to give you an example of something we've built to share information between ourselves and our partners. This is a weir on a river and there are tens of thousands of these in Britain alone. They're a huge problem in any sort of industrialised nation. They were built largely around... Um, the, the sort of industrial revolution, wherever there are mills on a river, you'll get a weir. There's lots of other impoundments and structures. They cause a problem because fish largely can't get over these, and they really affect the ecology in the river. They affect the dynamics of the river. Rivers aren't static. They're meant to move. They're meant to meander. The sediment and the, the sort of riverbed is meant to move, and these just halt that process, and they really have an impact. And Rivers Trusts are getting increasingly involved in overcoming these problems. And this is a before and after shot. This is um, a rock ramp that's been used to replace it. So it's stabilizing the bed to some degree, but fish can get up and down here now. And there are other solutions. You can put in fish passes if you can't remove the weir and tidal flaps at the bottom. And things that will help eels get up. This is a bristle pass that elvers can climb up over a weir. So there are a whole range of solutions. But how do you identify and decide which of these 25,000 barriers you start with? There's 56 trusts, you know, we don't have a lot of resource. And these are just the ones on the Environment Agency's national database. We know there's probably twice that amount that just haven't been mapped or documented. So we've got a lot of volunteers out, we've got a lot of fishermen out and about. We want to collect better information and we want to be able to share it with our statutory partners and with the universities that are producing network analysis models and prioritisation models. So we looked to build some sort of web-based platform that would help us do this. And our very first go was a very quick pilot that we tagged on to the end of an EU project. And we went with um, something that was a proprietary solution because it was quick and easy. We wanted to do it very quickly and just share some outputs. This down here is some prioritisation work that we did on eel barriers and eel habitat restoration. And we wanted to share some outputs from those SIMAP models that you saw. 
We also managed to negotiate with some of those third-party providers that we could put their results up as read-only data. Um, and we use this really to identify what the end user requirements are for sharing data, not just with the Rivers Trust, but with all of their partners and all of the, the government agencies. And from this, we came up with version two. And we wanted to be able to build multiple applications on the same platform, really. So we didn't want to have to go and pay someone each time to produce a new version of the portal. We wanted every bit of functionality to improve all of the other applications. So it needed to be scalable. And we've got funding coming from lots of different projects, but, you know, it's limited. So we need to look at cost and we need to be able to collaboratively develop this. So this is what we've gone with. We're now using GeoServer, and it's not all open source, you can see. It's based on um, a mix of open source and some Microsoft and various other closed source technologies. This is really down to what skill sets we have available. And, you know, we're on a journey here, so we're, we're moving along a, a, a sort of pathway, really. And this is what one of our applications looks like. This is our system that we've built for sharing information on barriers. And you can see it allows users to upload photos. They can also input their information on how passable that barrier is to different species of fish. They can edit the information that's already in there. And what we need to do now is really link this up with the Environment Agency system. We're already talking to them about how we can share this data live and share with the universities and other partners. We've got a long way to go with this. But we also want to use this to share information with the community and with those groups that are getting involved and volunteering and making a difference. And we want to share our successes and habitat projects and restoration projects. So we've built a demo application for Time Rivers Trust where they can share this information and they're updating this live as their catchment plan progresses and as they work with more and more people. And we want to do more. We want to let people put their own information in. This is an example from one of our Rivers Trust that lets groups basically say what their, their local catchment means to them and their local river means to them. We want to be able to share information on things like invasive species, which are a really big problem. We want to link up with other things that are going on. This is a mobile app that the Environment Agency in Bristol University developed for tracking invasive species. And we want to be able to tap into the citizen science, the anglers and people who are out on the river all the time collecting really good data. So open source is good for us, Trust. We, we know that this is going to help us get wider access to information and share our information. It'll build better collaboration. It'll help save us money. But we still need to sell the benefits to people. A lot of people still want to hold on to their data. They're very precious about it. And I would count myself in that. I get a bit scared about opening things up. And we've got a lot to learn, and there's a long way to go. But I'd be really happy to talk to anyone here who wants to get involved and, and is interested. So there's my contact details, and thanks very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Michelle. I probably shouldn't confess that by sheer coincidence, I work for the Environment Agency. An even greater coincidence, I work for the team that does WFD, the catchment management system, nitrates that Vasil was talking about, and linked data. <laughs> so I'll probably want to talk to you a bit later. I think so. Do we have any questions from the floor? Will you just say who you are and where you're from, please? Thank you for your presentation. My name is Tamara Colby. And... Um, I think it's wonderful how you're using the term ecosystem services, and I'd like to know how you explain that to the to the different members, the different stakeholders in the community, yeah. and um, then I'd like to know what your plans are for these, how to co value the ecosystem services and figure out who will pay for the benefits of the ecosystem services. But I know it's really hard to explain ecosystem services to people yeah. because it's a very abstract concept, so I want to see your way of doing it. Okay. Um, I'll try and answer quite quickly, but we've had um, a process running over the last year or so, which is called the Pilot Catchments Initiative. 
and it was DEFRA and the Environment Agency that invited groups to lead this process of trying to bring groups along in the understanding of all this stuff. And one of our trusts actually um, based their entire process on the concept of ecosystem services mapping. And the way that they brought people along was they actually held workshops and they got lots of map data. They literally printed off big maps of all of those sort of important things in the catchment and explained to people if you want to protect water quality you may be looking at the the zone around the river or upstream of a reservoir and here's where your water is abstracted so you're spending quite a bit of time explaining that process and it is hard without having the time but they got something like 70 different people in that catchment representing a whole range of organizations to buy into this process and over the the space of a year they developed rules that people could buy into about you know, how they map these areas that are important and then engaged with each other. So they had specialist groups that looked at each of those ecosystem services. They then brought them all together and discussed the conflicts in those areas. And they are then, they've got another process where they're actually going out and looking at the cost-benefit analysis as well. So it is all about partnership working. It's engaging with academics, with government who can do the cost-benefit analysis. And it's engaging with the community and having time and really good mapping and visualisation skills, you know. This is really, really important. It's the telling the story. And one of the other groups, Eden Rivers Trust, they had a really good slide in one of their presentations which was listing all of these terms like ecosystem services mapping, source apportionment, and they just said this means nothing to anyone who isn't involved in catchment management, and it's so true. There were just three questions to ask and answer from the, the people involved. Is there a problem? How much of the problem is down to me? And what can I do about it? And that's what you need to break it down to. You can go into the science and you can go into all the, the sort of prettiness behind it if someone's interested but if you can answer those three questions and as someone's interest grows you start to involve them more in the story and that's how the Rivers Trust are approaching it but it's really hard it's something we struggle with all the time there's just so much to get your head around so we still have time for some more don't worry we were running 10 minutes late initially Uh, so I'm Mason from Welsh Government. Um, great presentation. Um, we're, I'm, I'm actually on a project at the moment looking at um, potentially providing some environmental data using crowd sourcing okay. um, technique. I just wondered whether you'd, you'd, you'd done anything like that because you've got a heck of a lot of volunteers yeah. out there. Are they collecting any data for you? And if so, how are they doing it? Okay, that's a really good question because it's something that I'm just starting to tackle now. We've got... Um, a couple of projects are about to kick off where we've got water companies funding projects to do um, volunteer monitoring of things like water quality. So we're literally just starting to try and pull together the pieces between groups like Earthwatch, which are um, also rolling out citizen science monitoring programmes, and the Environment Agency have a new draft action plan on volunteer monitoring. <laughs> So we don't have any solutions yet, but we're just starting to look at developing apps, developing the data standards. That's the really important bit that I'm trying to get to grips with now. And we've literally just got sign-off from DEFRA for some funding to, to put together the groundwork for that, the foundations, how we make sure that anything that all of these groups are collecting is based on a standard that means that we can then put it in one place and share it again and making sure that we don't have a hundred groups going off and doing different things it's it's difficult we're only just at the very foothills of it now but i'd be really happy to to have a chat to you and share what we're doing and, and find out what you're doing thank you very much michelle we'll end it there um you have Quite a lot of choice.